Everybody doing okay? All right. If you want to open your Bible, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 1. Now then, no, I am not a prophecy expert. Not even close. Like if prophecy expert were a galaxy, I'm in a different universe. Okay? I, I, I think I used to actually have a copy of Prophecy for Dummies somewhere around the house. Still didn't understand it. Anyway, uh, just something that kind of stood out to me this, uh, not this week, last week, uh, in, in just kind of my daily reading, and I just kind of wanted to uh, share it with you just because it, it's something that uh, I've, I've worked through at different times, but uh, one time in particular found it very troubling uh, just because of something that somebody had said that just kind of, it's one of those things that stuck, you know. You, you listen to people, and we'll get to that here in a little bit, but I just kind of want to uh, get back into it for a little bit because I think it asks, to me, something that's very, very interesting. So, uh, again, we're going to be in Revelation 1. We're going to start in verse 9 just so we can kind of have all the background, Okay. It says, I, John, the apostle, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. In other words, he had been exiled there uh, because he was standing up for the gospel and preaching the gospel to the lost and ended up being exiled to the island of Patmos, okay, instead of being beheaded. We all know that John was the one that uh, lived to a ripe old age, right? He was never beheaded or or executed for his faith in Christ, but because of his faith, he was exiled to this particular island, okay? And that's pretty much where he lived out the rest of his days. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands, one like the son of, or like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, uh, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Pretty powerful vision, isn't it? Now, obviously, we know that he's talking about Christ, right? But what an, a, 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 what an awesome thing to see. Uh, awesome to the point that I think it'd be terrifying all at the same time, right? Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are, to, that are to take place after this. And this is kind of the specific part that I wanted to talk about a little bit tonight. It says, As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, so we've got this kind of a picture, and the Lord has explained a, a, a piece of it, right? That the stars that he's holding in his right hand are the seven angels of the seven churches. Now, what's kind of interesting about that is the, the, the Greek word for angel is angelos, okay? And that's, that's exactly where we get our word angel from. It's a direct descendant. Of, you know, one is just a direct descendant of the other. But what's interesting is the meaning of the word behind angelos. Want to hear the great, big, powerful meaning? Messenger. That's what it means. That, that's all that that word means. When you put it back into its Greek context, the word angelos is a messenger. And more often than not, throughout Scripture, how do we see angels being used? They're carrying a message from God to man. Right? We, we talked about that some this morning. We've talked about it last week. It seems like this, the whole Christmas season is kind of ridden with, with messenger, messages from angels to man where, you know, Gabriel comes down from the throne of God, tells Joseph, tells Mary, tells John, tells everybody what's kind of going on, right? So they, they, they carry messages. And it's interesting because now we have this picture of these angels 
who are the angels of the seven churches, and the lamp stands again being what? The churches. Okay, so we'll get back to that in just a second. And what has really intimidated me about this passage more than anything else that I've probably ever heard was a very dear um, elderly saint that, that I had. He was a deacon uh, years and years back. Great, great guy. Love him to death. He, he's since gone home to be with the Lord. But he looked at me one time when I was, we were talking about some of this stuff, and he said, you know, he goes, Brother Brian, he goes, you know what I've always believed about that, the angels of the churches? I said, what? He goes, I believe that those are the pastors of the churches. And I, I, I've since, since, since he made that statement, I've read some study notes and stuff like that that kind of indicate that same thing. But I'm going to tell you something. The first time I heard that very, very early in my ministry, it scared me to death. And I really tried to argue out of it a little bit. And the reason why is because I had this picture of angel far different than, or far different looking than anything that I could ever possibly measure up to. Right? Because every time an angel shows up in Scripture, this is an awesome, powerful being. Right? What is the one thing an angel says every time an angel shows up? Fear not. So what is obviously happening for him, happening for him to have to say, fear not? A great deal of fear. Right? Let's think about this, Ken, like Asha rules and stuff like that. Asha does not write a rule until, by, until somebody does something stupid and hurts themselves right? Well, you have this angel who shows up. The first thing he says every time he shows up is, all right, do not fear. Why? Everybody's terrified of this guy. So, uh, you know, I I don't know about you. I've never seen one face to face that I know of, unless it's one of those angels unawares things, which that's a whole other argument. But every time these guys show up, the first things they have to say is, okay, calm down. It's all right. Have no fear. Stand back up. And then I have this older deacon years and years ago going, I believe that angels are the pastors of those churches. Oh, thank you for giving me a whole new level of fear about my job. Now, I, I understand it, you know, the whole messenger part because, you know, relaying what God has burdened on my heart to tell everybody else. But the problem that I have, and, and not that I have a scriptural problem with it, I, I really do understand where he's coming from and it's more of a personal problem that I just don't like it because of the way it makes me feel because I don't feel I can ever measure up right it's one thing just to say that I'm a servant in God and, 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 and a servant of God and there's a certain point in that not that you get conceited or anything like that but it's just it's, it's the way of understanding who you are in relation to the whole thing okay I'm a servant of God and servants is lowly and pitiful awesome I, you know cool I can, you know, can almost do that but to elevate the status and say messenger slash angel of God, whoo, wait a minute, back the truck up. We didn't sign up for that job. But according to him, I did, and that was kind of an item of, not that we ever got heated with each other, it wasn't anything like that, it was just probably the most intimidating thing that I'd ever heard. And it, it, it's one of those things that still sticks with me. Because now we get to the other intimidating part about this whole thing. Right. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. All right, the messengers, we just go ahead and put it in its English form. The messengers of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. What does a lampstand do? Gives light, right? A lampstand gives light. Jesus said about lampstands in, in, in the Gospels, not to cover your lampstand, right? Not to put a jar or a basket over the top of your light, not to hide it up underneath a bed, but to put it up on a stand so that it gives light to all who may enter, right? And he says right here that the lampstands are the churches, and I think it's kind of interesting, and it's one of the reasons I read kind of the preceding verses to all of this is that it says that, you know, in, in, um, backing up into verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, verse 13, and in the midst of the lampstands. So you have these seven lampstands kind of almost in a circuit, circular picture the way that I'm kind of getting it. And the Lord Jesus standing in the middle of them all. As he should be standing in the middle of all of our churches. Right? 
Now we go back and we can take this a little bit differently and say that, okay, uh, Jesus himself said that where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. Right? Same word, in the midst. Jesus being in the middle of his churches. Now we all, we've, we've probably all read the different letters to Ephesus and Smyrna and the like. And some of the letters are pretty good. Some of the, some of the messages that he has for those churches being relayed through the messengers to those churches are pretty good. One in particular is really, really bad. But most of them have a little bit of good and a little bit of bad both, right? And we've often wondered, do those relate to se- you know, seven different time periods throughout the, the church age? Do they have to do with seven different types of churches existing all at the same time? You know, what is the, the meaning of all of that? And to be honest with you, I, I don't know. But I do know that when I read through that, and I read, you know, there's certain churches that I really like the idea of being. Philadelphia, for, for example. I really like the, the church at Philadelphia. I certainly don't want to be the lukewarm church, right? Because that's the one that he kind of, you know, he doesn't say anything nice about that church, right? He has these messages for these churches about what they're doing, good and bad and otherwise. And it, as I read this again, I got to be honest, it brought up several questions, more questions than answers. Um, as a lampstand, are we driving back the darkness? Are we really effectively driving back the darkness around us? Because we got to be honest. I mean, now if we were, to, now I'm not trying to pick just on, on on one church. Okay, understand? I'm not saying that we First Baptist Church of. That's not what this is. Okay, of course we could apply it to that, as we desire to do so. We could look at it collectively as all the churches in an area or a state or a country or even a time. But are we being effective at driving back the darkness? because to a certain degree does it not seem that darkness is gaining right and we gotta wonder why is darkness gaining ground you know I, I didn't grow up in an age where you use a lot of oil lamps right day one I had electricity so I had to actually do a little bit of research to kind of figure some of this stuff out and didn't realize it but back in the day there was an actual job on, on a lot of sailing vessels of a, tri- of, of a wick trimmer Right? His, that, that person's specific job was going around on a ship trimming all of the wicks on the ship so that the lamps would burn properly. And a lot of, especially very big ships, would have more than one of those guys going around. And the job was so prominent back during the day that even when everything became fully electric, they called the electricians on the ships lamp trimmers. That was still their official title years and years after they'd stopped using oil lamps because of the prominence and, and, and the tradition of the job. But it reminds me that a lamp requires maintenance, right? Matter of fact, even if you go back into the temple and the tabernacle, the priests were charged, I think, maybe not the Levitical priest, I think it was the, um, ah, forgive me, the, the other ones, I can't remember the name. Uh, but they, they were specifically charged with going around and making sure that the, the lampstand in the temple was filled with oil. Right? That was just kind of their job to go around and make sure that it never ever ran out of oil, that the lamps never burned out, that the lights never turned off, and to making sure that the, that the wicks themselves stayed in good condition. Right? Why? Because you want the lamp to burn brightly. It kind of made me wonder about, you know, if, if the seven lampstands are the seven churches, and regather, regardless whether it's seven specific churches that he mentions here in Revelation or millions of churches that have ever been since, could we not be doing a better job of driving back darkness? Right? Then I got to thinking about the oil, because these are obviously oil-fed lamps, right? Jesus told a, a parable about, you know, ten foolish virgins, right, waiting on the bridegroom to come back. And as they were waiting on the bridegroom, you know, all of, you know, they, they said that the bridegroom is coming, and they all got, got their lamps, and they all went outside, and they all waited for the, for the groom to show up, and it's a picture of waiting, you know, being ready at all times for Christ. Um, but only half of those virgins had, a, had enough oil to make it through the night. The other half did not. And when it, you know, they fell asleep, and when it came time for Jesus to actually come, or the bridegroom to actually come, 
the, the half of the virgins that were there had, were, was asking the other half if they could borrow some of their oil, which they did not do, and were forced to go into town and buy more oil for themselves, which is, you know, obviously the, the, the main thrust through that parable is, you know, be ready at all times for Jesus' return, and don't allow yourself to fall into a state where you're not ready for his return, right? Always being prepared, always being ready. But I got to thinking about that a little bit, that, you know, if you have an oil lamp, and oil is the fuel that, that powers that lamp, then you've got to replenish that oil on a figure, fairly regular basis. Well, what about us? If you have a lampstand and a Jewish lampstand having several points of seven, excuse me, seven points of light on a, on a lampstand, could you kind of take that literally by saying that, you know, we each represent one of those light bulbs on a lampstand? And are we individually doing what we need to do to replenish the oil that we're burning off because as we continue to serve as we continue to to follow Christ and do the things that he would have us to do you get tired right you get worn out maybe we get a little bit dirty here and there and all of a sudden guess what our, our lamps don't burn as well maybe we haven't trimmed back our wicks the right way and we're not putting out the flame that we should be putting out but doesn't matter how well trimmed you are if you don't have enough oil in the basin there's no fuel to burn because it's not burning the wick it's burning the oil on the wick right we have to go back to Jesus for the oil we have to be spending time with him so let me just say this um, in relation to that and I don't mean this as a specific admonition against anybody because I certainly don't know but here's what I do know If the only time that we're finding to spend time in the presence of God is on Sunday evening or Sunday morning or even a Wednesday evening, you're eventually going to run out of oil. If we're not spending time with him individually by ourselves, being filled by him, we're going to run out. And we're not going to be ready for the day that he comes. It's one of the many reasons why I, I, I tell everybody, and, and you're going to hear about this a lot, but it's why I tell everybody, spend time in your Bible. It's why I, I mean, if you don't have the time, make the time. And here, here's the thing, you know, and, and I'm going to be honest, because I'm probably the world's worst about using this excuse. I just don't have time, right? But here's the funny thing. Over the last 11 years that I've been in ministry, you know what I've always had time for? Spend time in here. That's probably the number one thing that I do do. But I've used that excuse in other areas. Well, Mom, I'm sorry, I just don't have time to come home this weekend. Mainly because I don't want to, but I'm not, you know, it's because it's not, I'm sorry, that's, I'm telling on myself a little bit. But it's because I haven't elevated the importance of that enough to make the time for that to happen. Right? Or I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to go run around the block a couple of times, which is obviously do me probably a tremendous amount of good but it hasn't elevated itself to the level of importance where I make the time to go and do that, right? Because we make time, if we're going to be honest, we make time for the things that are truly important to us. And we tend to put off the things that just aren't. And for my personal life and, and, and for, for the life that I want to live before God, I promise you, I make time for this every day. This is usually more often than not, probably at least 98% of the time, the beginning of my day. This is just where I start. Because I, to me, this is so important to spend time here that I prioritize this over and above everything else. And the reason why is because the thing that I've learned over the years is that as I prioritize this and spending time in his word, even just reading a little bit every day, he tends to help me prioritize everything else to fit around it. Right? It's like over the years, and I'm speaking to everybody in the room that's been married for a long time, longer than I have, but the thing that I learned from the very beginning is, and, and Danae and I both had to learn this lesson, uh, she has never been number one in my life. Not since, now, before salvation, she absolutely was. After salvation, she's always been number two. And I had to come, ter come to terms with the idea that after salvation, I was number two in her life. Because both of us were working to put God first. But the more that we work to put God first in our lives, he made all of those other priori priority relationships work out the way that they were supposed to 
between she and I, between our kids, between the rest of our extended family and the like, he is the one that has orchestrated everything else because we prioritized him in the beginning. Well, the same thing applies to, to the written word and the spending time with God in prayer and to dedicating yourself to that end, that when I prioritize God in my life, he has this really weird way of making everything else work out around it. And, you know, and the same thing goes back to like even you know tithing. At the, at the very beginning, I didn't tithe because I'd never grown up tithing. And the idea of cutting a check for that amount, well, let's just be honest. After I paid the bills back then, that money didn't exist. It wasn't there. Okay, mathematically, it was not there. Right? And I thank the God who orchestrated heaven and earth and all the timings thereof understands mathematics of a checkbook. And that was the excuse that I told myself. But then I actually did it out of a moment of frustration and wrote the first 10% check that I'd ever written. And I did it mainly in spite to prove somebody else wrong. And guess who got proven wrong in the whole thing? And now so many years down the road, guess what I've started to figure out? It's not that I can't afford to. It's that I can't afford not to. Because, again, he makes everything else work out around it. It's really uncanny the way that he does that, by the way. But... So I think about the oil and the lamp, and, I, and are you going to him in order to be refilled? Are we spending enough time with him to be refilled? Because I promise you, you know, uh, look, going back to the whole idea of being a messenger, I never, ever, ever feel like I measure up. And if I'm the only voice that you're listening to, boy, are we in trouble. Because I promise you're better off listening to him. Okay? never ever wanted to be put on a pedestal because he's the only one worthy of that. He's the only one that will never fail. Okay. So then we get back into the purpose. If in this whole scheme of things if the old dear saint was right and I'm the messenger, terrifying that, though that may be, and we then, and I don't understand how the dynamics of this work exactly, but just go with me for a minute, but if we then are, are, are the lampstands, if our wicks are trimmed, our basins are filled with oil, then there's no reason whatsoever for us not to be pushing back the dark. We just have to choose to shine. Now, I realize a Jewish lampstand never had a, a glass chimney on it, right? Like you see an old, you know, Coleman lantern or something like that that's got the little glass hoo on it to make the, the light that much brighter. But what happens when you allow that to fill up with soot? The light goes down. It doesn't put out the way that it's supposed to, Right? What should that tell us about the way that we live? Very simply, clean out the soot. Make sure that we're clean enough that when the, when the lamp is burning, the light is magnified around us. And you can't do that if you're living in filth. Whether that's a language thing, whether that's an attitude thing, whether it's an actual action thing, or even an inaction thing when God has called us to different things and we're refusing to go and do them, guess what? We're still living in sin, which is opposition to what he would have us to do. We tend to think his sin is kind of an active thing, that I go here and I do that, and that becomes sin. But I think for more often than not, especially in the churches, the most common sin isn't the sin of things that we go and do. It's the sin of inaction, the things that we know we're supposed to do and yet don't. Because sin is rebellion, Right? At the end of the day, when, when you look at it very biblically, sin is rebellion. I'm, I have chosen to live in a life of rebellion against God and his will. Right? And all of that rebellion builds up on the glass and the light doesn't shine. So clean the glass. Get rid of the stuff. You know, it's like, and with that thought in mind,
a second. I'm going to find it. Ah, here it is. It's 2 Timothy 2. Because, I mean, if you've allowed some stuff to build up, whether it be bad attitudes, an, 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 an attitude of rebellion against God, not just, to want to, not just doing, not doing what he wants you to do, or whatever the case may be. You know, what's funny is Paul gives us kind of a, a prescription for that, I guess you could say. And it's in 2 Timothy 2, starting in verse 20. He says, now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Excuse me, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Now then, we can understand honorable war use as a vessel that carries water, right? Good, clean drinking water. A vessel for dishonorable use is the exact opposite of that, okay? A.K.A. a chamber pot, right? But then he says in verse 21, and I think this is kind of interesting. It's always touched my heart a little bit. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Now let's go back and look at that because it says, therefore, if anyone cleanses. And sometimes we take the word cleanses and make it very, very superficial, right? Like a teenager cleaning their bedroom very superficial right the word is actually scours like elbow grease being applied scrubbing to the point where your skin falls off right and if it were a pot being used as a chamber pot I don't care how many cycles you run through the dishwasher you're still not going to drink out of it are you because that's just gross but what Paul is actually telling us here and the skirt and, and, and the scouring could even include a, a certain element of actually being burned in the fire to make sure that it is totally purified, right? And what Paul is telling us is if we are willing to come and, and, and be cleansed, scoured, maybe even burned clean, we can go from being a vessel of dishonor to a vessel of honor and be useful to the master, which is God, right? But before we can be useful to him, We've got to get rid of everything that makes us dirty. Right? But here's the thing, okay? Before we get discouraged and think that I'm saying something impossible, every single one of us at one time or another in our lives have been filthy, totally covered up in our filth. But through the grace of God and the bloodshed on the cross and our faith in that transaction, we were, we've been cleansed. What we forget sometimes is we have to go back in for a re I'm not saying a re-salvation. That's not what this means. But a re-cleansing. Because we get dirty just from use. Right? Take it this way. Even the temple forks used in the sacrificial system had to get cleaned every now and then. Because they had stuff on them that they weren't supposed to have. Not if they were going to be used again. So even the priests in the temple would scour the knives and the forks and the basins and everything else to make sure that it was perfectly clean, ready for the next sacrifice. Right? Well, the same thing can be said for you and I. That just through normal, everyday use, we tend to get a little bit dirty. We, I mean, we live in a dark, nasty, dirty world. And we're going to end up getting a little bit of stuff on us no matter how good we do. But we have to go back to him every so often and be clean so that we can continue to be useful. But here's the other thing. When, when you think about that, if I get rid of everything within me that is dishonorable, and we empty the vessel for his use, then I can be filled by him. And at the end of the day, that's what we all want, right? Is to be filled by him. I guess that's why he starts off in the letters talking to a church that had forgotten its first love. Because it gets covered up in the world and the filth and the mess and everything else. And it forgets that feeling you had the first time you came up out of the water. Remember that day? For some of us it wasn't very long ago. For some of us it seems like a lifetime ago. But remember that day when you first came up out of the baptismal water. How on fire for God that you were. And he says, remember that day. 
and live like that. Right? Live like that. I had an opportunity several years ago with a young, young. he was a boy, he, I guess he was eight years old. And uh, Cannon was a neat kid, truly, truly a neat kid. And uh, I, I, I truly think he had chaps and boots and spurs on the day that he was born. I think that's just the way he popped out with all cowboyed up. And he, he came by to honest. His dad was a cowboy and owned a ranch, and that's all he ever knew. And I, he went to school wearing chaps and spurs. He came to church wearing his chaps and spurs. He, I mean, you never saw Cannon without that stuff on him. That's just who he was, and he was just a neat, neat kid. And he came on a Wednesday night, and we were talking about uh, baptism and, and salvation, and he prayed and received Christ. And it was just one of those really neat moments that you get as a pastor to sit down with a young person who, you know, actually has a lot of the answers right, who, who has his heart in the right place and truly wants to follow after God. And we, we were talking about all that, and he goes, do I get to get baptized? You know, he was young enough where he couldn't even say it right. He was going to get baptized. And I said, yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and do that. And he goes, well, you know, and we, and we just, I answered a few questions about that. And he goes, well, do I wear shorts? And our church wasn't very fancy. We didn't have, you know, a lot of the different stuff. I said, yeah, of course you wear shorts and a T-shirt and stuff like that. He goes, good, because I don't want my buckle getting rusty. He was worried about his dinner plate of a belt buckle. And then when the day finally came for him to get baptized and sit there, I, I honestly forgot what I was doing that week when I filled up the baptistry. And I filled it up normal height. And Cannon was a little bit short. So as he comes down to the baptistry, he's dog paddling around me in the baptistry, right? Just, a, just, just being a kid, you know? And I remember on the, like the second lap around, I was kind of laughing a little bit because I thought it was kind of cute too. I just kind of grabbed him and picked him up for a second. We prayed, and then I baptized him. But you know, he was the most excited kid I've ever seen come up out of the water. I mean, the water's falling off of him. He's climbing up the steps. I got baptized. Just fired up and excited about it. How many times have I wished that I could go back to that level of excitement? Right? Maybe it's just a wish because I haven't gone back enough and gotten my oil filled up and haven't spent just enough time but I think it's possible. Because Jesus even said to the church at Ephesus, remember your first love and go back to that. Right? So let's kind of endeavor to do that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the day that you've given us. Father, we thank you for... Lord, we thank you for the love that you've poured out upon us, the gift of salvation that you've extended to each of us. Father, we God, we thank you for the faith that you give us just to say yes to you. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would help each and every one of us to return to that level of excitement, that level of fire and love for just following after you. Lord, help us to remember from where we've come. Lord, if we're not spending enough time in the Word, help us to make the time to make that a priority. Help us to spend more time in prayer, myself included, Father God. Help me to have a more consistent a more consistent pattern of prayer in my life. And I might spend more time just listening to you. Heavenly Father, we pray for our church. That as you've said that we are a lampstand. Help us to burn more brightly. Help us to cast back the darkness. That you may look down upon us and be well pleased. And Father God, if it hasn't been said clearly enough already... Lord, please stand among us that we might feel your presence, know your will, and have the courage and the strength to follow wherever you may lead. Father, we love you, and we pray everything in the precious and holy name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And everyone said? All right, I guess this is the part where we're supposed to take our prayer requests, right? <laughs>